Australia there's a term that's called tall poppy syndrome and um, I heard about this from a woman who came to one of my writing workshops and uh, she said um, I, I didn't tell anyone in my family that I wanted to, that I came to this workshop and I said oh how come and she said oh they just call me a tall poppy because they were from Australia I said a tall poppy and she said oh yeah and what it means is that if you're a tall poppy, if you hold your head up and say what you want to do, you're going to be the first one when the mower comes along to get cut down. And so in other words, it's like, you know, keep yourself low and go through life like this. And chances are you're going to be OK. <coughs> and I mean, that is so sad when you think about it, that like to, um, to not fulfill our own potential just because we're scared of being a tall poppy. When you think about it, being a tall poppy should be the one, you're the one who welcomes the sun in the morning. You know, you're the one who stands up. But no, tall poppy meant you're the one, first one to get your head cut off kind of deal. Kind of, really kind of sick. But actually, when I started being a writer, it, well, not when I was a kid. When I was a little kid, that's all I ever wanted to be. Couldn't spell. So, you know, everyone used to think, yeah, good luck, kid, you know, couldn't spell for beans, still can't spell, but doesn't have to stop you. Um, but when I started as an adult wanting to be a writer, I never told anyone. And uh, I used to do it at, like when everyone was in bed. And that was that same kind of thing. Like I didn't, I was too, um, I guess I thought people would make fun of me. I, I don't know why I, um, you know, I don't know why I was so scared of letting people know that, that, that I wanted to be a writer. Um, and then just by a bunch of quirks, my first book actually got published with very little problem, so, except that then I had a real issue because then I had this published book. And so then I had to let people know, you know, because people were phoning me up and saying, uh, we, well, we would like you to do a reading. And so, I mean, then that was like really scary because then I had to stand in front of people, not only admit that I was a writer, but actually do what you just did, reader. But every time I did it, it got a lot easier. And I found that people, they don't want to mock you. They're not sitting there waiting um, to see you make a fool of yourself. They're actually really interested in what you have to say. And they kind of, they like you. And there's this kind of communication. And it took me like, it took me 50 years to figure this out. <laughs> that really people aren't there to kind of like put you down. But I think because I'd been in so many poisonous situations, you know, that I had been put down always, that I thought that was what happened. And it's not. But I think for a lot of people, you go through a few situations like that and you think that's the norm, whereas it's not the norm. But that first sort of step of like, uh-oh, did I say that out loud? Did I actually state my feelings? Um, it is a, big, is a big step. And once you do it, you kind of realize like, yeah, that's okay. I think, um, I think even without opening our mouths, there are visual communication things that we do. Um, for instance, I'm, I used to stand like this, right? And I just kind of look at people like this and, I, and always, well, I still do this like my feet turn in like this, you know? But then you kind of like, if you want to bend your knees a little bit like this, you know, hunch your shoulders. This also helps with your anxiety. Anyone wants a bit more anxiety? Pull the shoulders this way, you know? And it does great things. So you know what's going to happen? People, of course, saw me as this victim because there's always a couple of people there who can make themselves feel better by kind of making you feel a little bit, you know. It's going to make them look a bit taller if you, <laughs> if you get a little bit more like this, right, you know. So um, one of the things, you know, big, big thing, just put the shoulders back and just stand up, you know, just have the head like that. I mean, you don't have to go like this, you know. I mean, that might be a little extreme, but you know, just like stand and just be yourself 
Um, watch it. <laughs> uh, just little things, but you know that kind of visual communication sets it up for the day, you know. And it's, it's such a tiny thing, and yet it is huge. I would say, like, if kids in school only learned that in a whole year, it could make so much of a difference in their whole lives. Just to walk out into the world um, with your head, your shoulders down, and your head up, you know. And then saying something out loud is um, just a lot easier, right? This particular workshop, because I'm using masks and puppets, I, I've always kind of liked um, masks and puppets because even when I had not said, made that first personal statement out loud, I found that if you have a mask on, you can take on a whole other persona. And in fact, I, I'm one of the leaders for a Celebrate Recovery workshop that we do every week. But um, it's all about wearing masks. And a lot of us wear masks to mask our real feelings, which is not a good thing. But what I found with masks was if you um, give a kid a mask, even if that child is like really, really shy, you know, they become this like completely different person if they've got a mask on. And I kind of learned this through my kids like at Halloween time. And I found that, yeah, you know, wearing a mask, you, you get this kind of anonymity. And once, once you don't have to be scared of like letting your, I don't know, getting mocked or whatever it is we're scared of. I still never quite nailed down what it was that, that I was so scared of. But once you have the mask on, it gives you a freedom. And um, years ago, I, I had probably the most eureka moment with this. There used to be, um, I did this um, uh, puppet play, and it was one of these schools that somehow managed to get some funding. So the kids made the puppets. The kids helped write the script. They were doing it in French. Um, they wrote their own music. I mean, it took us a whole year, but they finally put it together. But in this class, there were twins. And these twins had done the whole um, syndrome of sometimes if there are twins, they don't have to communicate with anybody else. And they just develop their own world. And some twins actually even develop their own language. And, and um, so these twins had become so shy that they wouldn't speak to anybody. And they'd sit in the class all day long and they wouldn't speak. They were so shy. And they were really trapped. It was really sad because they were bright, bright kids. So anyway, they get on stage with these life-size puppets. And suddenly they're completely transformed. And they're jabbering away in French. And then this went on through rehearsal and everything. And suddenly they sort of forgot about the puppets. And, and, and they became like these two completely different people. Because once they realized that they could speak and they could communicate with the outside world you know, through this puppet, then they realized that they didn't really need the puppet. And so um, that's how this kind of workshop came together a little bit. Because I realized that once you get used to having this prop, basically, speaking for you, you can um, get, get used to, once you do it, it's, you get a taste of it. It's a power, but I wouldn't say it's power tripping. But you get this taste of your own personal power. And we all have this beautiful empowerment, you know, this potential inside every one of us. And, um, you know, th to think of it being trapped in this little nutshell um, and, and never being able to shine out is really, really sad. But once you realize that, yeah, I can do that. And once you say, did I say that out loud? And then you say another thing and another thing. And it, and it just becomes such a wonderful uh, freedom and an enrichment, absolutely an enrichment. The other thing about masks <coughs> is um, I got sort of studying up a bit on masks. And ma I, only, I only brought this one little book. I got several books. Um, but, but a lot of cultures 
um, which, I mean, I think they're all a lot, we call them primitive but, or underdeveloped, but I think they're actually probably a lot smarter than they were, than we are today, because they had a lot less problems. But they had all these masks, and it was part of the culture that, you know, you would, you would use a mask to, um, to become another being, you know, or to take on extra power. You know, so I thought it would be fun to first of all have the mask and learn how to have this great freedom of of being something else, taking on another persona, and then you kind of realize, like, yeah, my I, I'm really quite nice. I think I like me better than this than this other persona that I that I took on. So that was how this whole um, notion of First of all, learning to communicate using, um, using a mask. Um, so what I thought we might want to do is choose a mask. I'm kind of having a bad hair day, so this kind of <laughs> looks a little bit. The reason I'm having a bad hair day, one of my kids left this um, hairspray like stuff, you know. And I'd been joking with Marie, like, because somebody about a year ago gave me a spa thing, you know, and uh, I never had a chance to go and try this out. And I was saying, like, oh, we're going to be on video. I should go to the spa. I use my card I've been, like, having for a year, not knowing what to do with. And, of course, I, I never got around to it. And so I found this bunch of spray stuff, and I thought, oh, well, <laughs> we'll try this. <laughs> so I put it, you know, like, ah! <laughs> And then I tried to brush my hair, and I realized that the hairbrush was redundant. And so, yeah, so here we are, my alter ego. <laughs> so the thing is, and I didn't, I, the thing is, you're all going to be asked to do this. So it is fun. So this is some interesting facts about myself, right? So I can be whoever I want to be. I have a few prompts here. My favorite activity or memory from childhood. Well, let me think about this. I will tell you my first memory from childhood, because this is another thing, too. I think when we're kids, we're probably as close to our real personality. And then I think it kind of gets squished out of us one way or another. My first memory is creeping under the window so my mom wouldn't see me. And I was pulling this little brick wagon. It used to have like little building blocks in. And it had a can of paint in the, in the wagon. And I wanted to do something really nice for our elderly neighbors. So I thought I'd brighten their life up by painting a mural on their wall. And I didn't have any brushes, so I used my mitten. And this was the old-fashioned paint, you know, so it was full of oil and lead base and uh, heaven only knows what, right? So I painted this beautiful mural on their wall. And my next memory is being sat on the window ledge. My legs are stinging because I got smacked. And my dad's trying to peel my, my, my paint-soaked mittens off my hands. But my main feeling was confusion because I was like... I don't understand why everybody is so angry. It's, I just wanted to do something nice and, and have this beautiful surprise, you know? So that's my first memory. What is interesting is years and years and years later, I'm actually getting paid to paint murals on people's walls. So in a way, it goes to show that those little dreams that you had when you were a child actually can be fulfilled. And perhaps that they do, in a way, reflect. So like if somebody really had a dream that they wanted to do something, and then they decide, well, no, that was just silly. That was me being a kid. Well, maybe it wasn't you being a kid. Maybe you just life got in the way of you know, being what you wanted to be. My worst fear, well, definitely being trapped in some small space because I'm um, claustrophobic. And I, even watching a movie where somebody's in a pipe or they have to go down a chute, can't do it. And actually, I really let myself down the other day. I was watching The Goonies with my grandson. 
And there's this scene where they go down this water chute. And I had to go out the room because I got quite nauseous. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, definitely my worst fear of being in any kind of place that you had to go through to, um, and one of the things I really like to do, what do I like to do? Oh, I like to do so many things. I like coming to these groups because, you know, I don't know if you realize it or not, but you are some of the bravest, most courageous people I probably will meet in at least a week. Because I know what it takes to come back and go back to school. And you know, the really sad thing is I meet so many people who would love to do this. And they just, they just, they're just too scared to do it. And that is that horrible thing about this fear. Excuse me, my hair's getting in my eyes. This horrible fear of fear of what I don't know I don't even quite know what holds us back but to see how you've overcome this fear and I you know it maybe sounds a bit corny but you know it's it's amazing and it's just so sad that other people can't do this there's a lot of people out there and for you guys to, and, and for us to be able to do this video is really really cool because there's going to be people who see it and they're going to think, you know what, maybe, just maybe I could do it. And every session we go to, there's always people in it who talk about how, um, how scared they were and how they maybe waited years before they actually got up enough courage to actually come and go back to school. So yeah, very cool. Uh, what do I find most difficult about situations such as this? Well, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe I guess I'm a little bit scared that people are sitting there thinking, what is she going on about? You know, like really, I come to school to learn stuff and I got to listen to this. So there's always that element there, you know, but there's always a little self-doubt, and maybe a little tiny bit of self-doubt is good. Like, maybe it is, you know? Because, like, it just means that we are re-evaluating, and it's good to re-evaluate. My main big, big problem all through my life has been I've been my own worst enemy, I've been way too critical, and I've never sort of said to myself until recently, it's okay, Nanny Jen. It's okay. And my little grandson, like, we'd have one disaster after another because he's the ultimate klutz. And when he was little, you know, there would be like, like a can of paint spilt or something like that. And he'd look at me and he'd say, But that's okay, Nanny Jen. <laughs> and I used to think, Yeah, you know. And so now I have this saying and I say it to myself, But that's okay, Nanny Jen, you know. And it is, it's like, so what? You know, so something goes wrong, or so somebody's not too impressed, or, you know, whatever. It's not the end of the world. And, you know, it kind of makes it a lot easier to take a few chances. Because the other thing I always say to myself, because I wrote this little series of books about this uh, purple moo and, and whatever, red romer and purple moo. It's about this little red figure and a, a little purple cow. But the saying that it always had was, if we don't do it now, we'll always wish we had. And you know, that I think is probably one of the worst things to ever have is to wish that you had taken that chance, you know? And so that's, I guess that's my other thing. And I'm gonna quit now because, lucky you people, you're gonna do it and I'm just gonna sit and watch. Thank you for being good listeners. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna put these out there. There's, I've got four of these little prompt cards. So you might wanna take uh, what, five minutes or, and, and write down a couple of things. It can be really about you, maybe you can share these, or it can be about a completely fictional character. You can choose. I should have, I should have had more of these, but I didn't. And then, um, 
you can use the mask to hide behind and just give, you know, maybe three or four, just a, you know, say a minute or maybe slightly more talk about yourselves or whoever you choose to be. Do you make these? Yeah. <coughs> Now, those particular ones, I used um, like a plastic wrapping, you know, that salad comes in. But I, I found, it, like the ones I've made in the past, I've just used um, cardboard for the base. And I think basically cardboard works better. Don't have it too close to your face because then your voice won't project. And just kind of have it up. Yeah. Yeah. We can't see you. Can we see you? No, we can I can see you. Can you see me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can be yourself again now. You, you guys have something that money can't buy. You really, you have this beautiful sense of, of friendship, of, of being together. That is, it's amazing. Like in most of the groups, it's not as apparent as it is in this group. So I just can't tell you enough how, like, how lucky you really are. Okay, one of the things I would really like to do is, I really like to help people, or I like to try to help people. <laughs> um, one of the things I really like to do when I was young was we used to play ball up on the field and go ice skating, make bonfires. And I really do get lost in words by time. We can do anything we choose to do, but then there are some things we are gifted to do. And I think that's really important in life is finding your special gift. Everybody has one. Everybody. I don't have a doubt in my mind. One of the things I really like to do is to come up to the Queen's Learning Network and maybe in the near future get my GED and to help my son through school. Excellent. <laughs> That's it. Okay, good. I got a question. <laughs> what's your favorite subject? Mm, science. <laughs> You're supposed to say science. Science. She told me. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Jeanette. I give you, when you get nervous, two key things. Take a deep breath through the nose, put the shoulders down, and just take a couple of deep breaths through the nose. And it is astounding what a difference that makes. One of the things that is really important that I, that I hope you will get out of this, um, out of this, uh, workshop is making sure that when you're in a situation, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, you know, or maybe you're even like got two or three people in front of you, that you get out of the situation what you want out of it. So you don't end up saying, yes, well, you know, sort of kind of more or less, you know. The other thing is, so I, what I've done, I've set up topics, for instance. So I'll tell you what the topics are. Renting a furnished house, interviewing for babysitting, that can be interviewing for other things too, applying for a trainee receptionist position, applying for a sales position, explaining to a doctor that tests are required or that the medication is not suitable. <coughs> so they're all like, you know, basic things that you very well might encounter, you know, during life. So one person is going to be the interviewer. So one person is going to be the interviewee. So what you're going to be asked to do is figure out what kind of outcomes that you want to happen. So I'm going to pick one of these. I'm going to just pick, say, the renting the furnished house. So if I'm renting, if I'm the renter, I need to know a lot of things. 
like so I have to first of all decide and you probably the easiest way to do this is make a few notes on paper because you're going to have time to discuss this you're actually going to have about <coughs> half an hour or as long as you need because I'm going to get you to pair into into groups of two that's not pair is it I'm going to get you pair <laughs> into groups of two that doesn't make sense but anyway um, and then you can discuss it decide what kind of things that the interviewer needs to know and what kind of things the person who is being <coughs> interviewed needs to know so that if you're going say if you really want a job say I don't know uh, as a sales clerk at Canadian tire store or something like that you need to make somehow get across to the person who's interviewing to you why you would be the best person for the job so one of the things that you might want to do in point form is figure out well you know what would make a person a really good job what qualities do I have so this is actually you know there's nothing harder I don't think than telling people how good you are because once again this taps into our lack of self-esteem which I just assume everybody has maybe some people are so full of themselves that they don't encounter this huge block but I have to speak from my own experience which is I'm always have a difficulty um, like selling myself right and, and you know so for the person who's being interviewed for a job they have to find ways of letting people know their skills their strengths you know the the gifts and the qualities that they're gonna in the meantime the person who's interviewing needs to know other things about this person is this person suitable for the job or would they be better off somewhere else you know so these are the kind of things for instance explaining to a doctor this is a very important one you know because you can go to a doctor and like maybe they're really really busy and you know some of them can be pretty full of themselves you know and like the thing is it's your body and you know what's happening but they're just kind of like oh no you do this you do this and I had like I still kick myself over this one I really do I had this experience a couple of years ago and I had I'd been climbing up a bank which was stupid anyway and I grabbed a hole of a piece of rotten wood and I fell back and I jammed another piece <coughs> of rotten wood like right into the back of my leg like right in you know and it snapped right off and like I knew I had a piece of wood like about stuck right in my leg and the flesh covered over it and I and my whole leg started to fester up and everything you know so finally this one day my husband said like you got to get that fixed because I kept thinking that it was going to fix itself you know because always too busy to go to the doctor or whatever that's my excuse so I ended up in the emergency and there's this smug little guy you know who thinks he's kind of so good and um, he told me there was nothing in my leg and um, I said I'm pretty sure there is and he said and I'll never forget his words he said no I'm the professional and of course like what I should have said was yeah but it's my leg but I went out of there and I let him do that to me you know like reverting way back to the way I used to be you know and I'm like and I, sh I kicked myself I was really cross because two days later <laughs> this great hunk of wood you know comes out of my leg and I mean you know all covered in pus and everything but you don't need the details but you know here's a guy and I let him do that to me so this is the kind of thing that also we need to be able to communicate and stand up for something you know we need to be able to say I know you recommended that medication but it's not suitable for me because I'm having reactions and sometimes you know we can get put down that way so that's another of the options you know and what's going to happen going to sit and, and you know spend like working two and two you know spend spend a while like formulating think about what what could be the outcomes like for instance if you're renting a furnished house like you want to know like is that person going to pay the rent 
because maybe if you're the person renting the house, you need to know that money's going to come in. You know, you also need to know that when you go back to your house, the furniture's not all going to be torn apart. You know, so there's going to be a lot of questions that you're going to need to ask. And you might feel embarrassed, you know, like this for me is a hard one, like asking someone about money, like, you know, can, uh, will you be able to pay me is like for me, a, a, would be a very, very difficult question. But it's a question that needs to be asked. So, so what you need to be thinking about this is like, what do I want out of this situation? So when you go into your pairs, um, the first thing you're going to think about, who is the doctor, for instance, who is the patient? If you're looking at, say, the sales um, position, you want to think about who's going to be the employee, who's going to be the person who wants the job. And then, like, by discussing between you, you're going to think about at least five questions from each person with fairly in-depth, like, reasoning. Like, okay, um, why, why are you looking for a place? Where did you live before? Why did you leave that place? You know, like, why don't you have any furniture, you know? Uh, all these kind of different things. In fact, maybe five questions isn't enough. You, you might, I would say a minimum of five questions. You know, like the doctor might keep saying to you, well, no, it works for everyone else, you know. Well, you keep saying, well, no, I need to have more tests or, well, you know, this kind of thing. Um, interview for babysitting, very important one. Or caregiving, you know. Because some people are so not suited for, for caregiving. You know, like maybe they've got a short fuse, or maybe they really don't love people. They're doing it for the money, you know? Oh, so that, you know, the participant might answer things like, well, you know, it's good money and I can, I can pick my own hours. That might, not, that might be your first key as an employer to think to yourself, nee, I don't think this person's got the right motivation. So maybe these are some of the points that you might want to think about. Motivation. Why is the person applying for the job, you know, either the sales position or the babysitting, you know. So what is their motivation? If it's just money, probably they're not going to be the right person. If they love working on projects, well, maybe, uh, yeah, they might work, might fit quite well in Canadian Tire or Home Depot or, I mean, I just threw in Canadian Tire as a, you know, um, and, and have they got any skills like that would, so that if somebody wants to know how to fix a toilet thing, have they ever done that? You know, so it could be, so these are the kind of things, and you can decide the outcome also because maybe you're not going to hire that person. You know, so that's another thing you have to decide. Is the character that you're going to portray with the answers and the questions, maybe it's not going to be suitable. And maybe the interviewer is going to end up saying, you know, I think you'd be way better suited for something else. So does this... Um, has anyone got any questions? Is everyone clear about what's going to happen? Yeah? A resounding yes echoed through the halls. Yes! yes. <laughs> Have you ever done before? Um, I used to babysit for my sister, you know, bad laps. Um, but I've always been around kids, um, and I, I really like helping out when it comes to kids. <laughs> Do you drink or do drugs? Um, uh, uh, I don't drink when kids are around. <laughs> How do you discipline them? Oh, uh, well, I don't like hitting kids because you can get in lots and lots of trouble for doing that. So I put them on timeout. What, what would you do if the baby became sick? Like throwing up? Yeah. I don't like puke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I'd call you and you could tell me what I had to do. What?
what would you do if my child got bored? Um, well, I guess if I was really in the mood, I'd play with it. And then, um, and if I wasn't, I guess I'd let them watch TV with me. Uh, do I get the job? I'll call you back and let you know. What is your name? Do you work? No, I don't. Do you party? No, I don't. Do you think that you could afford 600 a month plus utilities for a year? Yes, I can. Do you want to rent the house? Yes, I do. Do you think you'll come back to live in that house after I rent? No, I'm going to Cuba for a year. Do you think that house is good for me? Might be a little bit too big because it's a three bedroom house. Um, it's a light in with the rent? No, it isn't. Um, do you allow cash? Yes. Is all the furniture in staying in the house that when I rent it? It can if you need it. Uh, are there carpets in the house? Carpets in the bedroom. The rest of the house is hardwood floors. Thank you very much. I will give you a call. So how would you come out of that? Would you have wanted to rent the house? Yep. You see, the main the thing is you don't party. <laughs> I really enjoyed it because it brought me out of my shell more. I'm, I'm, I'm a very shy person, and I, I really thought that it was really neat the way that they used the mask to hide your, yourself so that you could talk to everybody else that was in the room. I really don't like to come out of my shell very much, but now that I've, I've done it, I can stand up without being too nervous. If I can do it, you certainly can do it. I mean, I've only had my grade six and now I'm at a nine, 10 level. So if I can do it, I'm sure that you can do it. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> I really enjoyed it, I really did. Jenny's funny and she makes you feel comfortable and that's why it feels like I can talk out because where I went to the Institute in Truro, the program we had in Truro. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. Today's workshop was, was fun. We learned a lot of stuff with puppets or without them. Um, I've been going to North Queens Literacy School uh, class for four years. And if anybody is interested, I'm Come ahead, come on down. It's fun. You learn a lot. I mean, I'm 52 years old. If I can do it, so can you. I was home day and night looking at the four walls. I didn't want to do nothing. I didn't want to go nowhere, and Rita got me back up here. And I don't regret it. I love it. I come every day. I don't miss a day. Like today, I spoke out that uh, I didn't think I could do it. The mask helped me a little bit, but I think I could do it without the mask the next time. I had a great time. It is very important to have a community that you can learn with. Here we help one another, we all get along fine. And it's always a fun day to come, because we help one another. <laughs>